far as I know, this was originally uh, going to be an hotel for the golf course. Uh, the Peel Golf Course was founded by uh, the Manchester businessmen that used to come over here on holidays in the summer months. And uh, of course they wanted somewhere to stay. And uh, what I've always heard that this was going to be an hotel for these Manchester businessmen coming over here in the summer. And uh, whatever happened to it all, I couldn't say, but uh, that's, that's what I've been informed. Yeah. And uh, then the, uh, Dr. Poyser went in here uh, in the late 1930s. He was, a, he was an icon in Peel, Dr. Poyser, because at that time you had to pay five shillings for the, for the visit. Uh, in the latter part before the, the NHS come in, so how much it was pre-war, I wouldn't know. But uh, he had a son, same age as me, and he was crossing the field there playing, and uh, he come through the gap in the hedge. Of course, in that time, in the war years, there was hardly any vehicles about. It just happened that this lone lorry was coming through, and he, and he run over him and the uh, lorry driver stopped, come out, it wasn't the driver's fault. And uh, he seen uh, there was a doctor in here and he picked, the, picked Ian up, brought him over, rung the bell and his Dr. Poyser came out and he had a son in his arms dead. And uh, obviously he never ever got over that, never, no. He, he, uh, it was the talk of the town for a long, long time, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, Dr. Poyser, uh, he was he was uh, used to visit all the, uh, the the houses around the town at that time, and uh, lots of them he never took the money off them. He used to just he used to do it. Uh, there was lots of poverty around then. Uh, people living on spuds and heron. You know, uh, uh, there's lots of uh, tuberculosis, TB. Uh, it's a different place now than what it was then, definitely. Uh, and that over there, that was the uh, the old school. And uh, the late Fred Palmer, he was adamant that them slates on there, they came from Country Head. But I have my doubts, but he was adamant that's where they came from. gentleman that lived in this house here, his name was uh, Quay, and he had a big set up and big bike, and he also had a, a vehicle in the garage up there, and then the Second World War come along and he couldn't use this uh, car, the vehicle, and uh, over the period of time, a tree grew up in the middle of the drive there, and uh, at, when the war finished, he was, he was elderly and he couldn't drive and he lived there for long years afterwards and this tree got massive. And uh, when he died, and, and um, obviously somebody else came in the house, they had to get uh, special permission then to cut the tree down to get the vehicle out. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a good yarn that went round about for a long time, yeah. This, this house here, Milvory, that was uh, Sophia's uh, two brothers and sister lived here. And there were three of them, they weren't married and they all lived together in here. And uh, I used to come up here with medicine from our shop for the for the for the doctor and he was a right tight miserable and they used to bring me into that room in there and he'd open the drawer and he'd take one of these little uh, bars of chocolate that they used to get round the town and these machines you put a penny in pulled it out and he would take the wrapper off the end and uh, <clears throat> it was only an eighth of an inch thick and he would get the last two ones break them off and then he would break break them in half and i'd have a little bit of chocolate the size of a postage stamp an eighth of an inch thick and he put it in the palm of my hand and turn my fingers over on it and i used to hate him and i used to come and then he pat me on me backside 
side, send me on my way, and I get halfway down the driveway, and I used to throw it away, and I used to mutter all sorts under my breath about him. <laughs> oh, he was, uh, he was a right old growl, he was, yeah. And uh, miserable as sin, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this was John Dale's uh, slaughterhouse and uh, that door would be open more often than not. He'd have all the carcasses all strung up in there and they would kill, they would slaughter the cattle, sheep uh, and pigs in there and then they'd wash down afterwards and uh, all down that gutter. It's, it'd be quite a common occurrence for all the uh, the blood and water all running down there. And on a Monday, the train used to come in here from the mart, and uh, of course they'd have all these cattle for the slaughterhouses, the sheep, and we'd be kids and we'd block the roads off and they would run them up, they knew which ones for which, which slaughterhouse. And it'd be like the, the, like the Wild West here on the Monday night, and everybody would shut their front doors in case you got uh, any of them, any of this uh, stock in through the front door, and then they put them all into the into the different places. And they would uh, he'd possibly have a, a cow, sheep, pig, whatever put in here, and then uh, <coughs> yeah, and then they would kill them that following day, I think, or sometime they would leave them for a little while to starve, and then they would. Uh, they would uh, slaughter them then, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was uh, a common occurrence most Mondays then, yeah, yeah. So that was all like excitable time, yeah. Run the cattle around the town. And the little black fellas, well, they were always the worst. The little black fellas, and of course, the devilment would be in us. And he would see a little black fella. And we used to used to get him going, and then he'd be running all around the town and everything. Then be down. Sometimes you get him down on the beach, and he'd be out on the tide, getting them back in again. Oh, it was a good sport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the original uh, post office, and they used to stable the. Uh, the uh, the horse up in, in the back, the stables at the back there, because when the uh, boat come in in the afternoon, they used to come through here with the mail with the horses and uh, whatever vehicle they had, and then they would stable them there overnight at the back, and then they they would uh, whatever there was here, they would be gone first thing, first light back into Douglas the following day for the nine o'clock steamer back out to Liverpool. Do you remember it? Yeah. It was oh no, that was <laughs> that's long before my time. The, actually, how I how I know that is the uh, the uh, gentleman that lived there. He he had the whole history of it, and it was him that told me that, and I never knew that until then. Uh, he said that uh, there was, he actually told me there were stables out the back, uh, and they used to put them in through there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, this area here had uh, <coughs> there was three uh, three little cottages, Daltons here, and there was a barber, a uh, sorry, a uh, cobbler shop at the end, and at the back here was all grass and a little old wall, and there was two slaughterhouses upside there, uh, Stanley Woods had one, and Quails, the butchers had the other and they would have the stock in the, uh, in the grass in the field here. And uh, it was quite common. We used to cl climb up and look over the wall and you quite common, you'd see a pig there and how it had uh, this neck cut and it was still walking around, sniffing about and then it would keel over and uh, they would have a big wooden tub with hot water in and they would put it in there and, and scrape all the, the hair off it. Uh, yeah, and there, yeah, and we'd, uh, we'd, we couldn't get in here, we'd just look over the wall and you could see that quite often, all that uh, slaughter taking place, yeah. And then there was, uh, Garrett had a slaughterhouse just down the way here, the back of the old Lloyds Bank building. And uh, uh, that was common, all this. Uh, and then the slaughterhouse down Castle Street, 
they were all open, it was all happening, nobody bothered. Uh, it was amazing, really. Uh, and then there was a water tank up at the far end there. Uh, and over the further again, the field out the back there, was that's where Peel uh, Football Club played. Up there where Baldy Spittle is there now. Yeah, the house is there. That was the field before they moved up to the present ground up but, uh, on the Douglas Road. Uh, and this building here, that was the, uh, the old math school. I don't remember that as a school either, but that's what it was. Yeah, school, yeah, for navigation. Yeah. Well, just just behind us here was the the uh, the mortuary, and alongside of it was the fire station, and they had the asbestos roofs flat, going going back the way, and. Uh, we used to play football round here. The ball went up one day up onto the roof and uh, one of the lads went up and he went through the roof and uh, down into the mortuary and there was a body on the, actually on the slab and he's screaming his head off and we, we all legged it. And uh, anyway, he, got, he did get out after a while. Uh, I think it must be one of them airlocks where you just turn round, but that was sick. Uh, that was quite a, an episode in life, yeah. Neen's coal yard came up, came up for a good winter out, yeah. Because they used to, uh, the Ramsey boats used to come in with the, uh, the bend boats with the coal, and they were all uh, dug out by hand. And then they had horse and carts, uh, kegs, horse, carts, and they used to uh, bring them up from the, up from the quay and tip it in there. Well, it got to be that got uh, a bit too far away. So they just, uh, he packed up and they went down on the quayside. They got the coal yard down there. There was two Quilliams, Quilliams and, uh, and the Kellys. They had the coal yards down there and they had it all sorted out, yeah. Uh, and then they used to t uh, dig the coal out they had these big steel bins, and they come up, but on, and then over the uh, over the uh, cart, uh, there was Johnny McGarry there. He was he used to knock the little latch off and upturn it, and uh, down, and it'd be coal and stuff all over the place. Yeah, and then when the boat finished, people would be down with the people used to come down with a shuffle, and then uh, and a little bag getting the coal off the key. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, lots of it used to end up in the sailor's shelter because they had the bogey in there and uh, the key man used to, uh, he used to get down first and shuffle it all up and bring it into the sailor's shelter. Yeah, and that used to keep them going in there then because that was a great place in that sailor's shelter. They used to play crib. Uh, lots used to get in there, all the old fishermen. Yeah, sailor's shelter, yeah. Uh, This here was the uh, slaughterhouse for uh, Bessie Shimon, or Bessie Kenyuk, as she was well known as a single name. And uh, John Kelly was the butcher, and uh, used to slaughter in there. Used to have, uh, it was like a double, a double room place, and he would have, uh, he'd have the, uh, the beast tethered up here, and the sheep in the pen, and at the back was where the, uh, they actually slaughtered them, and he was he was a, on his own. And when he wanted to pull for the um, <clears throat> for the, bring the beast down to the ring bolt on the on the deck, he used to come into the over to the uh, the young men's club church, young men's club over in uh, Market Street, uh, and we used to come over then and uh, pull on the rope. Seven, eight, nine, ten of us all pulling on the rope till we got the beast's head down to the ring bolt, and then it would, uh, he would, John would uh, pull ax the beast, flatten it, and he was. Uh, it, one thing I could never uh, understand: he had a, a very strong bit of wire, uh, must have been about a quarter of an inch thick, and after he'd pulled axed it, he used to stick this wire into the into the hole into the head and then wiggling around and there was a little hook on it and he used to pull it 
and uh, for whatever that was for, I don't know, but he, he always did that. that, that uh, <coughs> I never forgot that bit. And then uh, the sheep, he'd have a, he'd have a, a, a wooden uh, cradle and he would put the sheep on his back and then tie him down and then they would uh, cut his neck and he would bleed to death, the sheep. And then likewise, as said with the, the previously with the, with the pig, they would uh, have a big uh, barrel, as it were, and then they would put the pig in there and then in the hot water and then scrape, scrape it all off with scrapers. Yeah. And it was a great thing, any newcomer, John would sell them, uh, uh, we're going to shave it now, you go up to Frank McNeil's, that was the barber, to see if he's got a, if he's got a spare shaver for, for me, tell them my one's broke down. And then they would, they would put him on a chase, you see, and of course he would know in the, that barber shop, and he would say, I haven't got one, but if you go up to Jack Hines, I think he's got a spare one. And then you'd be running all around the barber shop till the penny dropped, you know. And of course, you were there. <coughs> when you got back, you see uh, everybody be laughing then, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great thing. That same was like apprentices, they had all them sort of things when you were uh, sent to go get up to Charlie Felton's for a bottle of blue smoke, and, and uh, they had all them sort of things, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, they would, uh, if you were there j just straight out of school, you would fall for these things all the time, you know. Yeah. And then uh, you were ridiculed then for a week or two till it all uh, passed over. Yeah. <laughs> this building here was uh, the Arnold Brothers, uh, and they had it as a kipper house, and this uh, that that was all open, and you could see all the, you could see all the kippers go running right all the way back on the uh, the tender hooks right the way back and the fire's all in underneath. And then it was actually a family lived up above, up on the, uh, the top two stories. It was unbelievable, really, how they lived up there and all these kippers getting smoked all down, down below. And then downside was uh, Frank Christian's electric shop. And when the televisions come out first, because nobody had one, and uh, he'd have one in the window there, and you'd, you'd be fighting to, uh, was that many yeah. of us here, uh, young people here, looking, look, trying to look into the, see the television, and then some, some wise guy would say, oh, it's a better picture up in Partington's, and then they, they would clear off, and then you'd be able to see it there. <laughs> This, this building behind here was the, uh, built as the mathematical school and then it became the church young men's school. Uh, no, just the church young men's and there was two uh, snooker tables in there and this is where we used to spend lots of the evenings in, down there and Louis Taylor that lived down in that stone build downside she was the uh, caretaker and she had had a, had a bogey in the middle and we used to sit down there uh, while you were waiting for your turn to play snooker and she used to make a cup of tea and, and uh, yeah it was uh, quite a quite a family atmosphere in there and we'd spend hours in there of an evening in the winter months uh, just playing snooker and she used to keep Rick on us all. If you if got out of hand, she wouldn't let you in the next night. And, uh, and then uh, John Kelly, as I said, would come down from the slaughterhouse and they would poke his head through the door. Come on, boys, want you there now? So we'd all run out then, all over the John's. We'd be gone there for half an hour or so and then all back onto the snooker again. Uh, uh, yeah, spent many a happy night down there. Uh, uh. <laughs> In World War II, in the Marine here, the RAF had the first floor as their quarters, and uh, the, in the middle there they had a, a, a bar, and uh, they never closed the curtains, and you could see them up there drinking after the pump shut, and uh, that, uh, that caused quite a bit of con controversy, how everybody else couldn't get a drink, and they could still drink up there. They were often called out with their planes crashing, uh, 
from the uh, trainees, pilots, and uh, lots of crashes, and bits and pieces of the uh, airplanes used to get washed up on the beach here. And uh, that was quite a, uh, quite a thing to, to find a bit of an airplane that was a treasure, bring it home. In fact, one day we had a, a fair, fair size of the wing and uh, over the far end of the promenade, and we'd come up the steps and this, the Pebble Guard soldier spotted us and uh, told us to stop because we kept on running. And we went right over to the end. And they often think where well, you kick the rock. And we went straight up there if it wasn't there. And uh, right up round Balaquay until eventually we got into, into the back garden of my house. And then uh, all the lads used to come and end around for weeks after to see this. Uh, bit of the uh, tail of the aeroplane, yeah. yeah. Teddy Nain's uh, bakehouse, I used to do uh, mostly bread. And uh, <coughs> off, a, off a Friday night after they'd been paid, there was a right old card school used to go in, on in there all night because it would be open most of the night, see bacon bread. And they all used to get in there after the pub shut and playing cards. And then every now and again, the police would raid them. Yeah? And uh, Teddy had the, uh, the shop of Christian Street and he used to have a football coupon and uh, with all the English football teams on. And at the bottom, there was a short list of uh, five matches. And uh, the great thing was top, middle and bottom on the eddies, whether the people would put down th three draws or home way away. And if there was three draws, it would cost them a fortune because everybody would have uh, three X's down, top, middle and bottom. That was a great saying around the time, top, middle and bottom. And then they would, and the police would raid the shop every now and again and they'd always get the tip off. And I remember Audrey, the daughter, telling me that uh, she heard this particular day, somebody come in and said, the police are coming up. And she said, I didn't know what to do. So I got all this coupons and the money all out of the till, special till in the counter and uh, brought it in, put it under the piano, lifted the piano lid up, put all this slot all in under there. And when the police come in, I was sitting on it. And uh, she said that they went all over the place, opening this, that and the other. And she said, not once did they ask me to stand up and open the, uh, the piano lid up. And uh, <coughs> there's uh, lots of yarns about Teddy Nade, yeah. Uh, he's a great character, yeah. It's like up at St John's there on the Mart day, on a Wednesday. The farmers would all be up there on the Mart at, and they would, uh, they'd be all in the pub afterwards and it was always known round here in Peel, don't go, don't go to Douglas on the St John's Road on a Wednesday after the Mart shut because these farmers would all be coming back with, the, with all, uh, all uh, half, half uh, full of drink, you know, and uh, yeah. <laughs> If you got the shirt to play for Peel, it was like going, you went out in that pitch like if you were going over the top in the First World War. There was no, prison, there was no prisoners. Uh, uh, that was the two main topics, uh, the fishing and Peel football. Half the town would go up there to uh, watch the football. And if Peel were in the final and the train uh, going into Douglas, the town would be empty. You wouldn't see a soul in the town here. All the town would be gone then to Douglas to the final on the uh, train, yeah. And once when the, uh, they were playing Ramsey and Ramsey won and they were coming back out of uh, St. John's, the Ramsey and the Peel train would be together and then the Ramsey would peel off to the right, go to Ramsey and they were holding this railway cup out, golden all the Peel ones, one of the, one of the gang on the Peel side reached out and grabbed the cup, brought it in and they had this cup and peel all that night. Ramsey had won, and the cup was going round and peel all that night in the pubs. <laughs> uh, uh. This, this building here uh, was the Albert Hall, and uh, it was a stone, stone built, 
uh, it was flattened. I just couldn't say when it was flattened all out, and then this was garage was built in its place. But the, the Albert Hall in its heyday was quite a quite a quite a place. There was a chap called uh, uh, Howard Yu, and he had uh, a, where Celtic Gold is now in Michael Street, and uh, he had a, there like a proper junk shop. When he died. I think the commissioners were in the best part of a week cleaning it all out. It was a right, right spot, stinking. And anyway, he had a, he had a, a, a film projector in there with the big reels, and he used to all go down there, and uh, and he would have the uh, the screen set up, and then of course he'd be trying to focus the in. And a great saying around the town, everybody had it, used to say up or down Howard, you know, it was up or down, up or down Howard. And that was a great thing when he was trying to focus it in. And uh, he'd show all these silent films in there. That was before my time, when I was a lad, like it was a dance hall. And then uh, on VE night, there was a right shalou in here, you know, with uh, all the army, the RAF, and the RAF and, uh, because they were the SC Rescue Maritime and they had lots of these red flares and they were setting these red flares off here and uh, oh, it was a right, right high jinx here, VA night, yeah. The soldiers and RAF and women and shouting and bawling, and congas out in the street here. There was all sorts going on, yeah. Bonfires on the beach, yeah, yeah. I was, we were down all over the place. I can't remember much about it, to be quite honest. I know we had a big party in Michael Street and um, down where ShopRite is there now. There's big tables there, cakes, sandwiches, and all that gold, you know. Oh, the whole lot was right shindig, yeah. 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 Well, I can remember all down here, yeah, off, off the evening, yeah. What I remember mostly was these flares going off because we'd, we'd, uh, we'd never seen fireworks or anything, you know, nothing. Yeah. Uh, nothing through the uh, wall. And then, of course, we all went up to the pictures here, the pavilion. That was a great thing. They would have uh, just up the road, and they would have uh, a picture on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then it would change Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you'd have one on Sunday. And uh, that was a great thing, all piling there. Uh, the place be chock a block, yeah. and that's we. Uh, uh, in between, you'd have a short one that would last 20 minutes, and then you would have uh, the uh, pathy news about what was all going on in the war years, and uh, all the shooting and bombing that was going on about. That would go on for a quarter of an hour, and then you'd have the main picture, uh, uh, and that was uh, that was the only outlet we were getting really on what was happening worldwide. Uh, and then above it was the uh, dance hall, the pavilion dance hall. That, they had a dance there every Wednesday. So on, on the, uh, the uh, you had to watch, uh, you didn't go to the pictures on a Wednesday evening because you, you couldn't hear it properly with all the thumping and banging that was going on up above you, the dance and the noise of the music. Uh, uh, that was great times in there. Uh, and uh, <coughs> always have some sport in there. Because uh, when things got quiet or, the, or uh, the, somebody was creeping up behind, the boys would all shout, you know, he's coming behind you. you know? Then the ones up the back in the DSC was shut up. <laughs> uh, 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 then there'd be fights. Uh, used to call it uh, the Gurner Pound down the bottom. Yeah, that was the name that was on it, the Gurnard Pound. We used to pay sixpence to get in. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the war years, the, uh, they had one period where they, uh, you had to bring all your aluminium down from the house. Aluminium teapots, saucepans, anything aluminium. And you just stacked them up at the front and you got in for free then. Uh, uh. As you can see at the back here, that was the uh, World War II prison camp. And uh, all along in the middle of the, uh, off the roadway there, there was a double line of, uh, of poles, barbed wire, with the, with the uh, cross member at the top. 
and then uh, there would be a soldier in, in between the two rows and that run right over to the end and then it also ran right up the hill here and then up Pebble Road and then down on the headlands and that was they were all encircled in there uh, with these uh, prisons and then uh, one time uh, there was a riot and uh, they had a job quelling it with the local police and uh, they, uh, <coughs> they got these uh, retired police uh, from London, retired Metropolitan Police, and they came over here and they were living in the houses in the town and uh, they, they had the Craig Mallon Hotel here. They had the, the base camp, that was where they, where they met. And then the, the soldiers, that was guarding the place, the Pebble Guard, as they were known, they also lived in all in the houses all in round the town. Sometime through the war years, there was a fishing boat used to come in here on occasions from Whitehaven. It was an old Danish built boat, you could tell like a pale blue, and it had a, a a fair lead fodded where they used to, Danish had a different way of using the scene nets and that had a machine gun mounted fodded on it and uh, the big tides uh, at midday, midnight, of course they'd been in the pubs, they'd come out and they'd, they were at the breakwater there and uh, with the machine gun fodder, they came in here and they give a, give a burst of fire on these uh, houses here. And uh, that was a right rump, as you can imagine, then took the sea, because with the being high water, they were right in close. And uh, the SC rescue boats that were stationed here, they went out and got them, brought them back in, and they had to go up to the court and they got, they got let off. I, I believe, as far as I know, told off, reprimanded, and that was it. So, uh, yeah, it was quite, quite some tales with them all. Yeah. There was one occasion, I think I've mentioned it before, when they were coming along Athol Street, and then there was the bus station there opposite the Royal, and uh, uh, the people were all waiting to go go across because these these uh, people the prisoners from here were coming past with the soldiers and then this chief PO that had been in the back had a few drinks he'd seen what was happening so he stopped them coming and told the people to go through and uh, and, he, and he went into the Royal with these soldiers uh, went and reported them. the police come down and they, he ended up going up to the court there, courthouse and uh, he said look, he said to the the Deemster, he said, I'm out fighting. He said, and, and uh, seeing men getting killed, so on and so forth. He said, now come home here. And he said, I've got to wait for these ones going past. He said, no way. So anyway, the, uh, he, 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 he got let off. Yeah, yeah. This time of year, in the heyday, this, this pub would be full of ring net boats now. To be 50, 60, 70 more of them, and all in here, permanently based. The ones from the fourth, they couldn't get back home. And uh, the ones from uh, Campbelltown and up on the uh, on the uh, Girvan Ballantrae side, they would be, some of them would be getting home at the weekends, but uh, through the weekdays, they'd be down here, and they'd be, they'd be oh, close up on a hundred of more of them here and they'd be fed, they'd fish in pairs. They'd have a neighbour, as they called them, and they'd be all here. Because in the spring of the year, they used to uh, paint them all up. So when they came here, they were in pristine condition. And uh, when they'd been out and landed their cats and washed down, they were just like yachts. They really were. You could eat your breakfast off the decks of them. They were that uh, lovely, you know. And they, were, they hadn't been long built. So they were all built since the end of World War II. And uh, it was a marvellous sight, seeing them all, six men on a boat. This town here was like Boomtown, it's like Las Vegas, it really was. And uh, it was down now, you'd get all the gutter girls would be here now. They was doing the uh, Salt Heaven. You'd have five, 600 of them here, and they'd all be staying in these houses around the town. And then at the end of the prom there on the, 
on a Monday night, they'd have a big dance. And of course, these uh, these girls wouldn't work Monday because there'd be no hand in from, from the weekend. And they'd be over there on a Monday night. God, it was, I tell you, it was, it was just like Las Vegas. And then, of course, once the heat got going over there, dancing, you could smell it. It was just like being in a Kepa house because uh, Round you see where they were living, there was no, there'd be no water, just tin baths. How, how half of them were getting washed, I wouldn't know. But uh, they used to last plenty of scent on them, because halfway through the night, they'd be smelling. Coming down here, they'd be landing heron, and they'd be heron all over the place here. And you'd all, everybody used to carry a length of string, and you'd be putting the string through the gills and bringing a dozen heron home, six heron, whatever you wanted. Nobody was greedy. And then you'd fill your stock up, for the uh, for the winter, for the for salt heaven, and then uh, you'd have that full up, and uh, and then through the winter months you'd be uh, every Saturday everybody in Peely would be on. That was the great thing, spuds and heaven on a Saturday, and of course us being youngfellas we hated it. And then about the April time you'd hear them saying, I "Think there's a bit of rust getting in the heaven." Well, that was like winning the lottery, because uh, <coughs> they'd go brownie, you see, with the uh, been in the, uh, uh, in the salt all over the winter months. And uh, next thing uh, they say, oh no, I think that's, that's them finished. And then that was it then. You go down to Maggie Johnson's for chips. So we're having chips then. Chips for the, uh, for the uh, on a Saturday, chips for Maggie Johnson's and a big screw top of pop. And uh, well, that was something else. And then the next thing when these fishing boats come then, and you see land and heaven, then the only we're getting then on a Saturday in the summer then would be fried heaven, fresh heaven then, uh, or kippers. That's what you'll be on then all summer, kippers and fresh heaven. Uh, uh, well, you lived on the heaven. Uh, uh, across the harbour there now was the shed where they had uh, the mart in the morning. Each boat, each boat would send a man over with a sample. There'd be about a dozen heaven then. And then the buyers could see what what the heron were like, and they would act accordingly. If they're good, you see, they'd be good for kippers and uh, solid, hard heron for splitting for kippers and uh, plenty of oil in them. See, once once the uh, September come, they were like big spents then. They were no good for kippers because they were they 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 were full of roll, and they would split easy. Or they were all a spence like they'd, the row had gone out, you see, and they were just no good for kippers. They would, you couldn't split them open. So September gone, they'd, they'd be all right then, these curas then, they'd be good for putting down for the salt. So they were picking them up cheap then once the end of August. So that'll come in. And there'd be hundreds and hundreds of battles all over the, uh, all over the quayside here, out the breakwater. And then these battle boats from used to come in then September, Dutchmen and all the European ones, bringing them all out to Eastern Europe, uh, all the, the salt heron, hundreds and hundreds of battles. Uh, uh, that you thought it was never going to end. Uh, yeah, it was a great time, really was. Yeah, you knew all the you knew all these Scotch fishermen, everybody. They were all like family when they came over. And then when they were all going back, oh God, yeah. It was just like a death. Yeah. Uh, couldn't get over it. Yeah. Just happened as quick as that. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Uh, till the following following year. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was a great thing when they were kids going out the night to the heavens. We always went out on a Friday, whatever. Yeah. Friday all got, went around, went down on the boats. See the skipper you go out with a night to the heavens. You have a little pair of wellies on you, a gansey, uh, and then you <coughs> you'd be sleep half the night in the bunk. You'd be missing everything. Uh, uh, and then they all had uh, in the morning. They would ask you after the the cook would say after they'd got the the nets aboard and the fish, he'd go down and do the breakfast. And they'd always be heron, boiled heron, or, or a mackerel. If they got a mackerel. Say you want it fried or boiled? How many are you wanting? Yeah. God, they were good them here and then straight out of the sea. Yeah. Yeah. Just enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. And then they'd have all these superstitions, you know. 
throwing salt on things. And don't mention this, don't mention that. And then if they caught, if they didn't catch anything, it'd be somebody they'd seen on the way down or, or uh, something that happened through the course of the day. That was the reason they got, uh, got no fish. Then if they did get a load, if they did get a good catch, it was uh, <coughs> somebody that, somebody's geese good luck or she's good luck. Like, you know, that's how we got the good catch. Yeah. Yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't mention uh, anything with fur on or anything like that. And, uh, or, or, or salmon, you couldn't mention salmon, that was known as the red fella, yeah. And uh, in fact, there was one chap here, Jackie Robinson, he threw the, uh, the, the ropes off Lockie Horsburgh, as that woman was saying. Uh, and he went out and he come in full of mackerel, full of the mackerel he was, which was unheard of. So from that day on, that Jackie Robinson was always known as Jack the Mackerel. <laughs> And then he got married to a, a woman from from Newfoundland, and he went out there, and he become uh, in the government, and he ended up uh, a minister for fisheries in Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundland as the Canadians say. And then he came back. He I remember him coming back, and he had a big uh, suit on him and a waistcoat, and he had a big gold watch trimmed on his waistcoat. Yeah, all right, with cigars on him. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This harbour now would be full of gilpin, little five, six inch little fish. And we used to be up on Freddy Tia steps there, fishing gilpin on the length of cotton with a bent, a bent uh, needle, bent pin, and a little bit of bait. You'd be pulling them out one after the other. And if you're down on the bottom step and the tide coming in, uh, You'll be up to your ankles in water, and because uh, once you if, once you had to leave that step, you're right up at the top one, and of course uh, you, you didn't have the the length of cotton to pull them up there. The, it would bust. You see, so you you were virtually finished then once you left that bottom step. You're all right when the tide gone out, because you keep going down. Uh, you're on a winner then with the tide gone out. But used to catch it, lots of people used to get them feed the cat. Uh, the gilpin, yeah, boil them up for the cat. Yeah. It was this harbour would be chuck a block. And same as out the breakwater, back from blocking, full of full of fish. Yeah. And then all in the bay here we uh, big flounders. And they used to go out with a with a box with a glass bottom and they'd be able to see them on the bottom and then the other guy would have uh, have the big I forget what they call them, like a big lance to point on, stab them. And uh, that was a great thing then, uh, out there getting these flounders. Yeah. Then the odd time you would get the place. Well, if you got the place, you were all right. You could bring it home to eat then, because you couldn't eat the flounders. Yeah. Yeah. There was lots of the drift net boats here as well. You see, they were, they, uh, they had about 50, 60 nets aboard, and they would put the big curtain, like a big curtain out for the head, and the header would swim into them. Well, they would always get a brighter price than the ring net because the ring net boats would all go in a big uh, bag and then they would mash up a bit so they weren't so good for the for the kippers so the, like the drift net men would uh, they would get about a pound of cram more maybe a more for their heaven because they were always good good heaven the uh, place was alive with it all here these boats would they'd be all landed by now most of them and uh, They'd be heading all over the place, gulls. Gulls couldn't take off because they'd be at full head. They'd be regurgitating to take off, go back up in the sky again. That way off, they often see them doing that. They'd eat that, not that many heading. Yeah, yeah. yeah there was one chap here, he had a fishing boat. I forget what it's called. He was known as the Dorby Spook. And uh, yeah, there was an old stage, one of them old nobbies with a wheelhouse stuck on it. And uh, there was another one called the Sicily. That was similar. She was just an old, uh, uh, old one. Uh, they were hard men then. Uh, really were hard men. Uh, uh, and they all lived, they all lived six of them down there. A little, just a little pokey hole up for it. How they all lived in there. Uh, all lived, slept in that. Uh, it's a full time for them. Uh, yeah, but they were, 
they were seemed to be happy days, you know, happy days. Yeah. Everybody was happy. Yeah. Before this wall here was built, it used to be just an old stone wall, and there was a hut behind it, and. Uh, there was a chap in there called Billy Faleg. I think his real name was Billy Collett, and he was an old boy, and uh, quite a character. And uh, he was deaf as well. And every morning this time of year now, when the train used to come in from Douglas with the visitors on, they'd all be walking up the quay, and he'd be out shouting at them, go home, go home, They're coming here, stealing all our bread, eating all our food, go home, go home. And he'd be shouting and bawling, and uh, yeah. The police had to put a stop to it in the end with them. Yeah. And the great thing with us, with the Uflis, at the Uflis at the time, he had this uh, hut there and he used to get up under the roof where this, uh, the chimney from the bogey was going up and then put a sod on the top, smoke him out. And uh, he'd come out then, because you'd be all out here laughing your heads off. And he'd be out here and he'd chase you, yeah. chase you up and down the quayside. Yeah. Oh, he's quite a character, yeah, Billy Faleg. Uh, and then there was, a, there was another guy lived in the coal yard here. Uh, he'd been the chief engineer, and uh, I think he got fond of the bottle, and uh, he packed up, and he came, and uh, he lived in, a, in the hut in here, in the coal yard. He'd never seen him, he never come out. He was in there all the time, yeah. There's another chap called Jossie. He used to go down shouting cuckoo all the time. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Uh, he was early in him, especially if he had a couple of drinks and he had a pair of glasses on him there. They were like the, like the bottom of pop bottles. Uh, cuckoo, cuckoo. Then there was another guy. They used to call him Willie Pegout. He used to run around here pretending he was with his coat up, his Mac up, he could fly. Uh, Willie Peg out. We used to all shout at him, Peg out, Peg out. Uh, <laughs> then there was wee Bobby. He was a, he was a little uh, knock kneed and he could uh, he had a little ladder for cleaning the windows that went up to a point, you know, for cleaning the windows. And with it being knock kneed, he get us he could go up the top of it and put his foot round each each uh, side of the ladder and let himself go and he could slide down the ladder. Uh, we Bobby, he was the uh, the mascot for the Peel football. Uh, we Bobby, uh, yeah, there were some characters here that uh, really was. Uh, 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 there was one chap there, and uh, once he got a few in him, he'd be telling tales how uh, how uh, he was on the on the uh, <coughs> on the, the the battleship. Uh, out in the Atlantic when they show, uh, sunk the Bismarck. And uh, he said, uh, that was one of his yarns about how the skipper phoned down to me and, uh, and said, uh, we've tried everything, Bobby, but then uh, it's left up to you with your gun. See, can you do it for us? So he said, to stop. he'd look around and he'd say, Shh, don't tell nobody this. It's only you that knows it, he'd say. It's only you. And he say, I said, right, I, I can still remember it. He said, fire, that's what sunk the Bismarck, he said. Yeah, that was a great young know. yeah. I remember going out on the, uh, on the drift nets and uh, you'd be holding the nets and it'd be like this, you know, fine day. And the next thing, uh, there'd be a plane coming and the boys, would, they'd all been in the wall like, and somebody would shout, plane coming, and they'd all drop everything. And they would uh, pretend they had the gun up on the forehead and they'd be all standing there and they'd be going like this and he'd be shouting uh, green 4-0, green 4-0 and then they would uh, go around like this, all the nets would be left and he'd be saying green 4-0, green 4-0 and then he would shout out uh, one of our stand down and they'd all walk back and study on where they'd left off and the skip would be in the wheelhouse going crackers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they were all full of kick, all full of that, yeah. And people used to go down the streets whistling, yeah. See, people go, just go around whistling, you know, think nothing of it, you know. Singing, saying things, that's the way it was, you know. It's amazing how it's, and then all up Michael Street, you see, there'd be all horse and carts. All horse, you hardly see a vehicle. 
all down here, horse and cars. Uh, uh, amazing. Uh, I was changed. This, this here was the railway station, obviously, and that was the way you went in the entrance to, to uh, they had the little uh, hole there for the, uh, to buy your ticket. And the train actually come right into here. That's where the, uh, the buffers were. And then down here, halfway on the road here, would be uh, the blackboards. That was the wall of the harbour. And these blackboards run halfway down. The water would come over them at half tide. So the great thing was to see how, how long you could last going on them without getting a wet foot. So yeah, it was all doing there. And then at the wall from the, uh, uh, from the blackboard up to the top, once you could climb up that, you were somebody. Uh, it was like going from short pants into long pants, being able to climb the wall from the blackboard up over the top. Uh, so you go halfway along and stand till the water come up, come up over. Uh, and then, uh, it was actually a fella drowned off there, yeah, he slipped in, because they were all tarred, they were very slippy when they got wet, as you can imagine, with them being tarred. And there was a chap there fell in, he couldn't swim, and he actually drowned, and, uh, yeah. Because yeah. there was a slipway here, and then it was further along, another slipway up the end there. And the boat used to all tie in and out here. Yeah. And then the, uh, they had all the, uh, the sidings down here where they used to put the, the uh, carriages. Uh, and then over the far side was the goods shed. They had a big uh, cargo shed over there with an overhead crane. And they used to come on the, the big trucks with the cargo from, from Douglas. And then uh, they would offload in there, then shut them in. And then they, uh, the, the pebble was the peel train, yeah. Jack, something. he was the he was he was the engine driver, and he was good. He, he used to when we were going to school, like he he could always give that little bit extra, and uh, we'd beat the train out of Douglas, the one going south, and we'd be cheering there uh, all the time. He could give that bit extra. Uh, Jack Lowney, that was his name. Jack Lowney. Uh, he lived up uh, Patrick Street, uh, number six, the Pebble. Uh, one the Sutherland, two the Burby, three the Pent, the four the Lock, five the Mona, six the Pebble, seven the Timbald, eight the Fennell, nine the Douglas, ten the GH1, eleven the Maitland, twelve the Hutchinson, thirteen the Kissick, fourteen the Thornhill, fifteen the Manon, sixteen the Caledonia. <laughs> Used to rattle them all off. Yeah. 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 Spent many a, many a time on them. Five years going to school, Douglas. Walking from the station up to St. Ninians, wet through, in the war time, blackout. And then coming back down at night, 20 past seven train from here. And then uh, getting home then about 20 to six at night. A dead beat, yeah, wet through. Uh, Learned nothing. <laughs> uh, coming home then, and then uh, out gallivant, and then out at night again, gallivant. When they, they launched the boat up here, uh, like a, a, a nobby, and they used to have to bring it down here to, to tears down there to get the sails rigged out, uh, to get it under the bridge here, uh, like these big tides at midday, because they got an hour off school, and my father used to say all the kids from used to word would go round, and then all the kids from school would come down, all jump aboard her to ballast it so she could get in under the bridge here. And when she went under the other side, they all gave a big cheer. Uh, uh, that was a great thing, that. Uh, used to go round, yeah. Uh, and steady boats ready, big t any big tides coming, they'd be all saying, steady boats ready for going under the bridge. Uh, uh. Well, that building we can see up behind there is uh, West Marine. Well, prior to that, that was say uh, the uh, Nacle and Watterson's boatyard where they built uh, all these uh, ships. And the biggest one they built was a trawler for Egna. It was just over a hundred foot. And uh, she actually had to be towed up to Glasgow to get the steam engine in. And uh, when she come back, of course, there was a Peel crew went on it, and uh, they went up uh, 
round the Shetland, Lerwick, down the uh, down the east coast of England round. And when they come back here, they'd had such a good spin, uh, made money. Legner decided he'd build a, another one. And then there was another one built, Manx Princess, but she was slightly smaller. And uh, they were the two biggest vessels that was built. But they built hundreds of uh, nobbies and the bulk of them all went out to the Irish side. In fact, the Irish government uh, that time bought quite a lot. So, so they, had this, they had such a good name for the, building the boats. And uh, in fact, they built, uh, they took that water race from Glen Faber down to where that big oil tank is there, which was the dam. And that dam filled up with water. We used to uh, sail our yachts up in there. It was about knee deep. And that water then so in turn drove the big water wheel that, that went uh, uh, for, for, on the leather belts on, uh, for the uh, for the machinery in the in the workshop up there for sawing timber up, and then they built the ships both sides. And uh, in fact, uh, I've heard my father told me that they used to go to the Irish side um, and get the, pick their oak trees over there and get them shipped over the oak, and uh, and that uh, was that was a quite regular thing for them that. And they uh, to, for, to do that, yeah, they're quite a good name of the of the actor. And and uh, this this uh, cruiser stern you'll see on ships, they were the first to uh, design it up here. And in fact, they uh, believe the Admiralty wanted them to build uh, vessels here for the Royal Navy, and they wouldn't do it because they just thought they weren't good enough for the Royal Navy. They were just of that character. Yeah, it's amazing, really. And then you had the. Uh, the brickworks just downside here. That was the office, at the bottom there, and uh, the uh, the kilns up there were. Um, there was two chaps called Donald Neen in my time and George Wilson, and they would uh, start work early morning, and they would uh, take all the bricks red hot, coming out that the that they'd all been baked and they'd done so many, they'd finished 12, one o'clock and then they, they couldn't go any more further. And then there was, there was another gang would be filling up the backside with all the clayed bricks that had just come off the machines. And uh, they would do so many because it would only take so many for the actual fire and how it all worked around. So they'd be all on piecework. So the more they got in, uh, in the less time, they, they, they would, the earlier they would finish, and they'd be coming in on, uh, on with the little sack trucks with about a hundred. I think they carried about a hundred at a time. They'd be running in and out, and then you had the quarry up uh, up the top here, just up the river a wee bit there, and they used to bring the clay from there at the latter end. That was quite a depth, and they had the mach uh, machine house at the top. Used to bring the little uh, steel trucks up with the iron wheels and then put them over on the bridge. And then uh, there was a little pony. He, he, they were only little ponies. And they would bring uh, about five, six of them at a time all the way down on the riverbank. There was like flat plates. And then they would go across into the, into the, uh, into the brickworks with the, with the clay. And then they built a big new machine house in there sometime in the uh, early 50s. There was a gang coming over from Accrington Way, done all the machinery in there. And there was, there was a chap called Jack Lee, he'd left school. And uh, the great trick was when they were coming down, they used to work like boom, 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 and then shove them out. And they would take two at a time, put them on, clay. And then these, these guys that would be there a while could put their hand in under the, under the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the cutoff. And which they shouldn't be done, the safety uh, bar, and take these out. Well, Jack Lee done it. He was only a lad of 14, and the thing come down and chopped his fingers off uh, for, for about 14 years of age. And he got 2,000 something pound compensation for it. Uh, Jack Lee, he's dead and gone now. Uh, uh, some stories of that brickworks, yeah. Used to deliver the uh, bricks all over the island, uh, yeah. and then they went from here then up to the ragged, and they started getting the the uh, clay up there, 
But I think what happened up there was uh, they were going met. These were all imperial, nine by four and a half, and they were going uh, over the metric then. And uh, they were running out of clay up there as well. One thing and the other, and they just decided to pack the lot up. And that was the end of it, yeah, the peel brick, yeah.